Hi, Brooke. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Hi. Oh, this is our first time reconnecting since way back when, when I got to walk alongside you on your fertility path. And yeah, I'm so excited that we get to talk again. I'm so grateful too. And just to, for you to open up and share your story, which is one of the, I mean, I don't know of many people that have endured a path like yours, which it started back in 2018 and I'll have you share where, where it all began. Yep. But to endure the amount of transfers that you've gone through and, you know, I only went through one. So to hear, to hear nine, which I'll have you share and nine's my lucky number, lucky number nine. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to see where you're at today. Thank you. Yeah. It was, you know, one of those things that going through it, it's hard to see the other side, but there was just, you know, there was that little light in me that just told me I have to keep going. So I, yeah. I, in some ways I can't believe it. In other ways, I'm just like, I, I knew I was going to do it. I just didn't know it would take me nine drives. Oh my gosh. Well, the endurance and the just commitment to endure this path. I, I talk a lot about this, but for you, like you're a near and dear client of mine who I just, I adore you. And Thank you for sharing because I think so many are going to get a lot out of this and you're going to help a lot of people. Yeah. So, thank you so much. Of so course. back in, yeah, you reached out to me in July of 2021. Mm -hmm. Your journey had started back in 2018. Do you want to yeah. take us back there? Sure. Um, so I met my husband um, down in Washington, D.C. We both lived there post-college. So we got married in 2016. Um, and we lived down there and, you know, we're having had a lot of friends down there, um, but we're both from the New York and New Jersey area. So when we knew we wanted to start a family, we knew we wanted to move back up this way. So we moved up to New Jersey in 2017. Um, and we actually lived with my parents for a year as we were, you know, mm -hmm. trying to save money and trying yeah. to buy a house. So, you know, we kind of put the the family planning on hold a little bit <laughs> while we were living with them. Mm -hmm. um, but we did buy a house in 2018. Um, and so by, you know, that summer, I think I went off birth control for the first time. And then um, by that fall, we were like in the house and um, started trying for a family. And I didn't really anticipate, but I kind of had a difficult time. Like when I came off birth control, I didn't get my period for like three months. Um, and I didn't really know what was normal. I kind of was just like, oh, maybe my body's just regulating. Um, and it's funny too, because of course my first thought was that I was pregnant. So mm -hmm. I remember actually going and picking up a pregnancy test and like shaking as I was taking it. Cause I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I got pregnant this way. <laughs> oh. Of course it was negative. Um, <laughs> and then in the months after that, like my cycles were just very off. And then, so at that point I started to realize that like, this probably isn't normal. And, you know, I was on the birth control pill since I was like 18, I think. So mm -hmm. when thinking back, I really have no idea, like if my cycles always were like long and irregular because I just been on it for so long. And I just assumed that, you know, I had a regular cycle and I wasn't going to have any issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and so by the time 2019 started, you know, we had been at it for roughly like six months, maybe a little more than that. Um, and I have a family friend who actually is a fertility nurse at um, one of the large clinics in New Jersey. So I think my mom must have gotten lunch with her, saw her at some point, and then just kind of came to me and was like, hey, like, you know, just in case you want to reach out and set up an appointment. So I ended up seeing the fertility actually. So what started, I went to see my OBGYN first, and that was mm -hmm. in, I think, April 2019. Um, and looking back at that conversation, honestly, I'm like appalled at some of the wow. things that she said to me because um, I was teaching bar method um, classes at the time. So bar classes and I was, yeah. you know, I thought I was in like such amazing shape, but they basically were telling me that I was underweight and that was the reason why I wasn't getting my period. And she was like, yeah, just eat some avocados and olive oil and gain a little weight and you'll be able to fix this problem and you don't need <laughs> IVF. And like, looking back at that conversation, I'm just like, I can't wow. believe she said no testing no nothing because your periods were irregular you said right they were irregular. Mm -hmm. yeah but she was basically almost like blaming it on me for being too thin which oh. is obviously not the reason why like this like now I know years later that was not why this wasn't happening for me so mm. anyway I went to that appointment and she basically referred me to the fertility clinic which was the one I was going to go to because I had this family friend that worked there um so then I made that appointment so I think my first appointment there was in May of 2019 Okay. Um, and so we did all the testing with the fertility clinic and 
Um, I don't know if they ever said to me officially, like you have PCOS, but that was what was suspected just based on the blood work. And they were able to see when I did the ultrasound, I had all the follicles on my ovaries. So it looked kind of in that like PCOS pattern that is typical. Um, and so, you know, I was young at the time I was, I think 31. Um, and Mm -hmm. so we decided just to start with IUIs because they didn't necessarily think that IVF was needed. It was, you know, an ovulation issue. And once we could get me ovulating, um, then I would get pregnant. So we started with the IUIs. Um, and I think the first one they had me try Clomid. Um, and so for some reason, like my body just didn't respond to Clomid at all. Like I, my numbers were just baseline and they just never moved and my follicles never grew. So I didn't last with that. I just did that one, um, like week of Clomid. And then they had me start taking the injectable, almost like IVF medications in order to, um, grow the follicles and then get ready to do the IUI. And, um, the issue with PCOS is, you know, it's a good thing for IVF because you have so many follicles and so many eggs, but doing Mm -hmm. an IUI, it's pretty risky because, you know, if you have all of those follicles and then, you know, they do the insemination, you could yeah. basically have multiples. Um, right. it works. So that was sort of the issue I was having was I was growing a ton of follicles and then, um, my uterine lining never really was like catching up to the point that they wanted it to be at the time mm-hmm. of the IUI. So I did move forward and I did do two IUIs, which both didn't work. And then on the third one, um, something got messed up with like the medications and the timing of it. And that one ended up being canceled. Um, and Mm. so at that point, you know, we just had to regroup with the doctor and, you know, I was kind of bummed out because again, like I had talked to that OBGYN and she was like, you don't need IVF. So I like never (laughs) thought I was going down that path. And then he basically said, you know, I think you're a really good candidate for IVF because you are making all of these follicles and, you know, we're able to control the timing of things a little bit better. So you don't have to worry about the timing of your lining, lining up with your follicles. And so, um, you know, I felt pretty positive at that point that this was going to be the path and it was going to work and I was young. So I was going to get, you know, good embryos and probably one and done. And that was it. Right. Um, So (laughs) we started with IVF. Um, it was that summer of 2019. So I think we did the egg retrieval cycle Actually, it was like end of August, early September that I started that um, because I remember the egg retrieval was on my husband's birthday, which is September 11th. So oh my God, don't you love those significant dates? It's like, I remember yeah. surgery on our wedding anniversary. It's like, oh, this is so fun. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah. So, I mean, the cycle was um, pretty successful because again, I had all of these follicles. So I think that I had, I'm not even kidding you. I want to say it was like 52 eggs that were retrieved. Oh my so gosh. it was a ton. Wow. Um, and I didn't write down all the numbers at the time, so I don't know the exact like attrition rates and everything, but I know that I did the PGT testing on the embryos once we had them. Um, and we ended up with 19, like PGT normal embryos, which is is incredible. So a lot. Wow. (laughs) So for that, I'm thankful. Um, I kind of knew at that point that I wouldn't have to do an egg retrieval again that, you know, And I was like, oh, I'm not going to have 20 children, not thinking that it was going to take me all of these transfers just to have one. Yeah. Um, But so at that point, you know, we had the embryos and then we started to talk about doing a transfer. Um, And this is where I started to realize that my uterine lining was becoming an issue. So Mm -hmm. we went into that first cycle in October 2019. um, And they want your lining to be like above a seven millimeter minimum. Um, And I think mine was at like, somewhere in like the high fours, maybe Mm. like low five millimeters. Um, And so my doctor was kind of like, you know, we can go forward with it. I have seen some pregnancies, you know, with aligning this small. And um, so, you know, I wasn't feeling too negative. I knew that maybe it wasn't ideal, but it's, they still seemed positive about it. Yeah. Um, Or I'm sorry. So the cycle in October actually was canceled because, um, (sighs) we never got it to a good point. But then when I tried again in November, the second time, they basically started to see that this was a pattern for me and, and basically were like, um, you know, maybe this is just your body and this is as thick as it's going to get, like we should Mm -hmm. go forward and just try it and see what happens. And so we did that transfer in October or sorry, November. Mm -hmm. Um, and that one actually did work. So when I got the, um, call, I didn't take a pregnancy or anything beforehand, you know, I was so new to this, like now yeah. that I'm a veteran, I know, you, you know, are. when you could take pregnancy tests and everything, but I waited for the phone call and it was my family friend who was my nurse. And, you know, she was so excited and, 
Um, we talked about the next steps, about more blood work, and then eventually ultrasounds. And so um, my beta numbers, I don't remember exactly what it was, but they did rise. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we got to that first ultrasound, I want to say I was around like five weeks along. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you were supposed to see a gestational sac and a yolk sac. And I don't think I ever made it to that appointment. I think I started spotting like sometime between after I'd gotten the beta numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I told my nurse, I was a little bit concerned. Um, and I'm trying to remember because this was so long ago, exactly like the order of how it happened. But I think it, we basically did another like beta and it had gotten down. So we basically, it was sort of like a chemical pregnancy, I would say, because wow. we never really got to the point of, um, seeing it on the ultrasound and, um, this, you know, being the first time I had literally ever had a positive pregnancy and I really had no idea what to expect. And so I was like, so excited and thinking like, this is going to happen. And then, you know, within like a week later, whatever it was, it was, taken away. And, you know, that was in November. So then we're getting towards the holiday season and mm -hmm. having to go through all of that. It's just COVID in the middle of COVID might add that. Well, too. it was actually right before COVID. So it was oh. um, the end of 2019. Um, I, so okay. I didn't even know any of that was going to yeah. happen. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. So that mm. was really, really tough. Um, mm. And, you know, I think I had to wait, I don't remember exactly how long it took for the beta basically to come down to zero. Um, and then when I regrouped with my doctor, he basically, we realized at this point that my uterine lining, not getting thick enough was an issue. Um, okay. and so there were a couple different things he wanted to try. One of them was taking a certain medication and a certain supplement. And with that, you had to do it for three months, um, basically before he would try the transfer again. So we knew at the end of the year that we weren't going to be able to try again, at least for another three months. And that's mm. also devastating to hear when, you know, at this point we'd been trying for, about a year, maybe a little over a year at that point. And I'd seen the positive and then, um, you know, you just want to keep trying as soon as possible because all my friends, you know, were starting to get pregnant at this time too. Mm -hmm. And, um, I actually remember it was early 2020, right before COVID one of my good friends, um, I went to her baby shower and, you know, I, I didn't really want to go, but I wanted to support her and be there. And one of my other best friends, when I was there, told me that she was pregnant. And I just remember crying so hard to my husband that night. Like this was still the period of time that we were waiting. We couldn't even try again. And it was just yeah. devastating. So I, many can relate to this and we'll, we'll talk about that too, but just, yeah. okay. So you then, know, it's hard because I, I wanted to be there for my friends, but looking yeah. back at it now, like I know that I probably was not the best friend at that time because I just didn't want to hear about pregnancy things. And, yeah, yeah. um, you know, my second friend that had told me they ended up doing a baby shower, um, over zoom because it was during COVID. And I actually called her beforehand because I just had, and we'll get to this as I finish my story, but I just had a failed transfer. And I was like, I just, I can't go to this baby shower. And I, I did end up going on zoom, but you know, it was really mm -hmm. hard for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Thank you for sharing so on vulnerably about that. Yeah. A lot can relate to that, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, so basically once we were able to try again, we had tried a couple, I feel like I tried everything in order to get my lining thick enough. Um, I tried those supplements, which maybe had a slight impact. We changed the way that I prepared for the transfer. So when I first started, um, the clinic standard was to give the estrace pills. Um, so I had done them orally. I had done them vaginally, which mm -hmm. if people don't know they're a blue pill. So it like turns your underwear blue, <laughs> like who invented that? Um, yeah. <laughs> and then I tried, you know, doing the like IVF shots. So basically to like grow the follicles and make my body's own estrogen instead of the oral or the extra estrogen adding in. Um, at one point I was doing estrogen injections. So like it was, I just, I tried everything and um, we made how many minimal... transfers, how many transfers at this point had you done? So I think if I'm remembering correctly, after that first one, where I did get the positive beta, I had three transfers after that, that just all completely failed. Mm -hmm. Um, and so at that point I also had, you know, another regroup with my doctor after trying like all of these different things. And the clinic at that time was doing, um, a research study. So they're a big research institution too. And, um, there was some thought about how um, using your body's own stem cells could help like regenerate that lining in your uterus. And they thought that I might be a good candidate to try out this um, medication basically that I would, what happened was they did like a DNC procedure on me and then they gave mm. me that medication at the same time. So the thought was the DNC is causing like an injury to your uterine lining and then the stem cells are, I'm probably not explaining exactly right, oh, but they're supposed yeah. to help 
regenerate it. So at this point I was desperate and I was like, I know that there's no guarantee this is going to work, but I'll try it and I'll see what happens. So I think it was my uh, fifth transfer at that point that I um, mm. signed up for this clinical trial and I went through with it um, and I did get pregnant after that cycle. And then in that pregnancy, I made it to that first ultrasound, um, but we didn't quite see exactly what we wanted to see. I remember like we saw the gestational sac, but mm -hmm. we weren't quite sure if we saw like the yolk sac. And okay. so then um, shortly after that first, or I'm sorry, I'm probably, I think I'm mixing it. I think that was my first pregnancy was we had the gestational sac, but never saw the yolk sac. And then the second pregnancy, we saw that. So I felt good about that. You know, we made it a step further this time, yeah. but then it was that second ultrasound. I was supposed to hear the heartbeat and I never made it to that ultrasound because, um, there was one night and this just happened out of the blue. I remember my husband was out walking the dog and I was sitting on the couch and all of a sudden I just had these major cramps. And I remember Googling, like, is this normal in pregnancy? I thought maybe it's just you know, mm -hmm. something that happens. And then as soon as I stood up from the couch, I knew that I was bleeding. And like, I pretty oh. much knew I was having a miscarriage oh. went upstairs and like, it was so much blood. And so I called my nurse and they had me come in the next day. And, you know, she said to me, sometimes this happens in pregnancy, like sometimes people bleed and it's okay. And, you know, so I had a glimmer of hope, but as soon as we went to ultrasound the next day, like they didn't see oh the pregnancy gosh. anymore. So we knew that I lost it. Oh. So that was, second time, I believe it was the fifth transfer. Um, so again, you know, having to wait for the betas to go down and being completely crushed and just the way the timing worked out, this again was at the end of the year. I want to say this one was in like October. Um, so also having my birthday is in November. So also mm -hmm. having another birthday, another year, not pregnant, like just lost these two pregnancies now mm -hmm. having to go into, you know, Hanukkah and Christmas and the holiday season and the new years where everybody's like happy and, all my friends have had their babies at this point. So they're posting all their baby pictures. And, you know, I, I was depressed, even though I probably, nobody would have known it. Um, Cause I just tried to put on a smile and, you know, you were working, life, right? working full time. Yeah. I was working full time through this. And I would say the only positive of COVID happening was that I was able to work from home. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to kind of basically do this without anybody from work other than maybe one close friend that I told know that I was going through all of this. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so then I remember at that point, that was when we, we started talking with my doctor more seriously about surrogacy and like whether this was ever going to work for me. Um, and so we, we did look into that option and I actually did sign up with a surrogacy agency. Um, and because it was COVID, it was really, really hard at that time to find women that were willing to be gestational carriers. Um, mm -hmm. So they told us it was going to be a long wait. So we kind of went into that with that mentality of it sort of being a backup plan. Like I'll keep trying as much as I like physically and mentally am able to keep doing this. And then, wow. you know, if it doesn't work out, we sort of have our plan B. So um, let me ask you, were you paying out of pocket or did you have any insurance coverage for any of your transfers? Um, I did have insurance coverage, so they covered the egg retrieval for the most part. There were certain things we had to pay for the genetic testing out of pocket, which is expensive. I want to say, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars yeah, at least. Yeah. Um, and then the transfers, I can't remember. They may have covered the first one, but then after that, um, it okay. was all out of pocket. And luckily, because I did have this family relationship with my fertility nurse, my doctor was giving me a little bit of a financial break mm -hmm. on them, which I'm so thankful for. Cause honestly, um, it was a pretty big financial break he was giving us. Wow. Um, so you had the same doctor helpful. throughout your whole treatment up until the last. Okay. Transfer. That's right. And we'll get yep. to that. <laughs> um, so at this point, you know, we, we did sign up with the surrogacy agency, which that is expensive out of pocket. But the reason that we did it was, um, they said if for any reason we canceled, like up until the point, basically when we accept it and match from them, that it would be fully refundable. So, mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of money to pay up front, but we, you know, just did it just to have that backup plan and know that at least we could get on that list and, um, get started on that process if we, if we needed to. Um, okay. so we had that in our back pocket and then we had tried transfers six, seven, and eight, I guess, at my, um, fertility clinic. So I believe it was transfer number eight. That was the third pregnancy. So I, I finally got pregnant again. Um, and was that, that right one, when you came to me, I'm trying to remember that. that I think I came point. to you. It must've been after that 
second loss. Like you had done six, tra- I have some notes in front of me. You had done six transfers, mm-hmm. four failed, two resulted in a miscarriage between yep. five and six weeks. Yep. And you did share that you had struggled with thin uterine lining, um, recurrent implantation failure, recurrent mm-hmm. pregnancy loss. So those are the mm-hmm. things that I knew at the beginning working with you. Yeah. And so at this point, you know, I'm so desperate. So I'm doing so much research. I had joined Fertility Rally, um, a support group, which is how I had been connected with you. And so I was connected with other women and getting other ideas of different tests and different things I should be asking my doctor. And honestly, you know, he was, um, so he's been in the industry for like 30 years. So he's very like old school, but not necessarily like closed-minded. So some things that I came to him with, he was all on board for trying and other things he was kind of like, eh, that doesn't make me comfortable. Like there's no research to support that. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we tried a lot and then Finally, by that eighth transfer, I think what I did that cycle was I wanted to try a natural cycle. So like just to see, you know, what my body does on its own with no external medications, knowing that because my cycles are longer, it would take a little bit longer, but I did eventually ovulate. So um, we did that natural cycle. My lining wasn't amazing. I want to say it was like somewhere in the sixes, Mm -hmm. Um, but we decided to go forward with it and I did get pregnant. And so each pregnancy that I had, I got a step further. So this one, like the betas were higher than they were previously. That first ultrasound was good. Saw the gestational sac and the yolk sac. Second ultrasound, we heard a heartbeat. So this is the first time I've ever heard a heartbeat. And it was on the lower side, but it was of it was above what my doctor wanted mm-hmm. to see. So literally he gave me a hug that day. He was like, we're going to do like this exact same thing for baby. No-. Like he's talking about baby number two already. So I was like, okay, finally starting to feel like more comfortable with it. And then after that, um, the next pregnant, the next ultrasound was a week later at that point, I didn't have any symptoms that were concerning. Like I just kind of felt things were moving Mm -hmm. appropriately. And then at that ultrasound, I could tell as soon as he started doing the ultrasound, um, there was no heartbeat at that point. So yeah, it's devastating. And honestly, it's like, I didn't even cry in that moment just because I was just so shocked. Like I just, couldn't believe that I was here again, like after getting all of over all of these hoops, like finally seeing the heartbeat. Mm. Um, and again, same time of year, I think this was, it was actually it's interesting. I just realized this, but it was October 20th was the day that I found out. And then my DNC was October 21st. So, oh. um, which is my daughter's birthday, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to that. So it's just kind of oh. crazy how the timing of it works out. Yeah. Um, so he basically said, you know, your body hasn't recognized the pregnancy loss. So you're either welcome to see it like when basically you'll miscarry on your own, or we can just do the DNC and basically get it over with. So <laughs> I decided just to do that because he said he would rearrange his schedule and do it for me the next day. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I was thankful for that. But um, again, this is also like 2021. So it's still COVID rules. So like my husband Mm -hmm. couldn't go to the DNC with me. I'm going in there alone. And I just remember like walking into that operating room and seeing him and like tears like down Mm -hmm. my face and the, the nurses trying to like, give me the IVs. And they thought that they, I was crying because of like the needles. And I was like, no, it's not that like I'm pregnant. And then like, I'm not pregnant anymore. And like oh, ending pregnancy. So that was, I thought that was the lowest point of the year. And then, as you said, um, my brother passed away, like literally a month after that. And so that was just like <laughs> the icing on a shitty year. And, um, mm-hmm. just, really bad two, three years at that point. <laughs> oh, Brock. And it's like, you know, and horrible to say this in some ways that happening took my mind off the miscarriage. And, um, in some ways it made me feel really selfish for still, you know, being upset about that when we had all of this going on with my family. So mm-hmm. just, just a really hard and <laughs> devastating time overall. Oh, we talked a lot about Drew and, um, him guiding you through this and being with you through it all. And yeah. Yeah. And, um, sort of one of those things around that time, I mean, continuing to, and one thing that, you know, you helped teach me when we, we were meeting and you were coaching me was just mm-hmm. listening to my intuition. And mm-hmm. like you said, you know, this was a really long, um, process. I'd been through so much trauma at this point. Yeah. Like how could I keep picking myself up and keep going? And it was because there was this little part of me that felt like I hadn't 
exhausted all of my options yet. Um, I had started to probably around when we started working together, thinking about getting a second opinion. And I always just kind of brushed it off because I had this personal relationship with my nurse and my doctor, and he was open to a lot of the things that I suggested. So for a while, I, I, you know, um, didn't like want to go down that path. And this third loss just really pushed me over the edge. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I need another opinion. Um, and so I had been researching, um, there's something called PRP, which is platelet rich plasma. And that was another like new thing that some fertility clinics were doing that was supposed to help, um, kind of boost like your uterine lining and make it more receptive to the embryo. So I found Mm -hmm. this doctor in New York city, um, who was really one of like the pioneers of it. And so I decided to have a consult with him. Um, so I think this was, I think it was even before, it was right after the loss and before Drew passed away. So it must've been like October or early November um, of 2021. Um, And so when I had the consult with him and he kind of went over my background, he said to me, you know, you could definitely do the PRP and I'm happy to do that for you. But I actually think um, 90% of the patients that I see with this issue, um, they either have what's called a uterine septum or they have scar tissue in their uterus. Um, Mm -hmm. And basically when I remove this, there's no like blood flow that's getting to that area. So even if you have a pregnancy, there's not enough blood flow to support that embryo. And that's probably why you're losing these pregnancies. So if we clear that out and we restore that blood flow to that area, like I'm, I'm confident that like, that's going to be the issue and and this will help you. And of course I'm skeptical as he's saying this because I've had hysteroscopy before, you know, my previous doctor had done that at some point. And, um, he did tell me that he did see a small septum that I had. And I thought that he like fixed it. I don't know exactly what you do to fix the septum, but I thought that was taken care of. And he told me that he didn't see scar tissue with that first hysteroscopy. So I was skeptical, but I was like, you know what? Like I went to this doctor for a reason. Like it's minimally invasive. I would say, you know, I did have to go under anesthesia to have the procedure, but it wasn't a huge deal. So I decided mm-hmm. to do that. And I remember, um, I did the hysteroscopy because it was sort of aligned with when my betas went down and, um, when I got my cycle again, but it was on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so, oh, what a fun Christmas Eve. Oh, um, I'm Jewish. So that's, you know, I wasn't <clears throat> celebrating the holiday much anyway, but it's just kind of like <laughs> funny driving into New York and there's literally nobody on the road. Cause everybody's oh. <laughs> celebrating Christmas. Yeah. So we did the this hysteroscopy. Was this the reproductive immunologist you saw? Was this the special? Um, so he was, he's not a reproductive immunologist, but he does incorporate some of those practices like into um, okay. the cycles that he does. So, cause I never ended up seeing an immunologist. I just ended up like incorporating some of those things in. Cause it was okay. like also one of those kitchen sink things. Like I didn't know if I had an immune issue, but I just wanted to try yeah. anything at that point. Um, okay. So we did the hysteroscopy and he did tell me that he saw the septum. Um, so he said that he was able to fix that. And then he did see scar tissue and he was able mm-hmm. to clear that. And he actually took like videos during the hysteroscopy. So I remember afterwards, he took my husband and I into his office and he was showing us like, here's the area, like there's no blood flow. And now you can see the blood flowing through it. Wow. And so he was like all in and he was like, yeah, I don't even think you need to do IVF. Like you probably could just get pregnant on your own now. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, I'm so far into this. Like I have embryos, like we're doing a transfer like yeah. next time. <laughs> what doctor, did you want to give a shout out to that doctor you saw that helped you? Yeah. So his name is Dr. Murphy, M-E-R-H-I. Um, so he's yeah. rejuvenating fertility center in New York and he's wonderful. He's just such a positive person. And if anybody yeah. follows him on Instagram, he's really fun. Like he likes to do dances like with his staff and yeah. um, it was just such a, like, a, see him. <clears throat> yeah, it was such a breath of fresh air, honestly, mm-hmm. um, just like going to that clinic. And um, I even remember at one point I made like a little friend in the waiting room and just people seem so friendly and it was just such a different experience that I had. That's great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so then I guess just to finish my really long story, um, the next month we went into the transfer cycle there. Um, and you know, I live in New Jersey going into New York cities, not, not horrible, probably is like 45 minutes without traffic, but you know, we're going before work and my husband would drive me so that I didn't have to worry about like driving myself and parking and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going through the cycle and I think my first lining check, my lining was at like a five or a six or something. And so that was typical what I'd seen. And so the next appointment, you know, I'm not really sure what we're going to see. Like, is it going to be stuck there? Is it going to be any better? And during the ultrasound, like the doctor's not saying anything. So it wasn't Dr. Murphy. It was one of the other doctors there. 
I said like, and he said, oh, you know, you're, you're ready for transfer. We're going to set up the date. And I was like, what was the lining? And he said, it was a 10. And I was like, it was a 10. Like, uh-huh. are you kidding me? I'd literally never seen over like a six before. So I just was wow. like, oh my God, I, I can't believe my body did this. I think this could uh-huh. actually work. Um, and I remember going down to my husband and he's like, he couldn't tell exactly, like, I think I might've still been wearing the mask. So he couldn't see my facial mm-hmm. expression. He's like, well, what was it? And I was like, it was a 10. And he was like, oh my God. <laughs> so, wow. Like we just couldn't believe it. So then the transfer was set up. I actually just had my transfer anniversary. It was yesterday. So February. Oh, was it? February. Yep. We're recording this. Yeah. Early February. Yep. Um, and so went into the transfer and Dr. Murphy did the transfer and, um, I posted this on my Instagram, but he said something like, Oh, next time I see you, you'll be pregnant. And it was one of those things. Yeah. I was like, okay, like I've been here before, like, we'll see. And I remember like getting, I, I took a pregnancy test before the beta cause I couldn't wait. So I yeah. knew it was positive. Um, and my beta was the highest it had ever been. Um, and so I just kept, you know, making it further and further and, you know, hearing that heartbeat for the first time was reassuring, but again, I'd been there before. So I wanted to make it like to that point of graduating the clinic. And even then, like, and we can talk about this more too, just, I had anxiety, like throughout that whole pregnancy, every time I went for an ultrasound, I was holding my breath and being like, this is the one where it's going to end. Like something's going to go wrong at some point. And so, um, you know, that was really, really hard to go through pregnancy like that. But as I got further and further along, I started to feel more confident and, um, you know, knowing that, my lining was better from the start and everything was just, you know, um, much better this time around. And Mm -hmm. uh, your journey has been one for the records. And we talked about this a little bit too, but, um, Mm -hmm. it was so interesting because I saw all these signs that reminded me of my brother drew like right around this time. So yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact timeline of it, but I think it was right around the transfer. Um, the two things that I saw, one of them was, a Facebook ad for the Cape May Brewing Company, which was yeah. his favorite beer. Um, and I've that. literally never seen an ad for them since then or before then. That was the only time I've ever seen that ad. And I was like, he put that there, like, of course. Oh, yeah. And then the other one was, I think it was the day before the transfer, the Wordle was um, Elder. And that was what he used to call me and my husband. Um, we went to visit him once in college because I'm eight <laughs> years older than he, he was. <laughs> So oh like God. that whole weekend, he was like, oh, you guys are the elders and I'm oh, showing you the elders all weekend. God. And so like when I saw that as the word, all it also reminded me of him. So those were the two things before the transfer. And then on the day of my beta, which again was in February, um, I was sitting down for lunch and at my dining room table, there was a little ladybug on the table. And, you know, this is in the middle of February. So you don't usually see a ladybug in the winter. And it was one of those things that I was like, he he sent that here and he knows that it's a big day and like <sighs> watching this and, you know, it was just, it's just crazy the way, you know, certain things like that work out and the timing of everything. So I mentioned previously that my DNC the year before was on October 21st, 2021. And then my daughter was born this year or last year, October 21st, 2022. And <sighs> I didn't realize that until after she was born. And I just got the chill saying, saying that it's just like, you can't believe in. I do feel like my brother was up there somewhere, like making sure this was the one and this was going to happen. And oh, you know, it's, it's one of those like weird things about the circle of life. Like it's so horrible to say you know, one ends and one begins, but, um, we gave Mila, my daughter drew is her middle name. And so I love that so um, much. There's, there's always going to be a part yeah, of him that's with her and she'll learn about him, you know, when she's a little older. So making me tear up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> And here's that's my, that's my journey. And <laughs> however long it took me to give the whole story. But. Wasn't Cardinals work Cardinals a big part of him too? Yeah. So that was something, um, a friend of my mom's had told us, you know, after he passed away that we should always look for Cardinals and, um, you know, that she actually gave us these bracelets. I'm actually wearing it right now. You can see this one has the cardinal on it. It's probably hard to tell with the lighting. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, so now whenever we see a cardinal and it's funny because last year, um, my grandma lives in Florida and for the longest time, there was this one Cardinal that kept coming to her window and it was like tapping into her window. And it was like, that's, she used, she called the Druina. <laughs> this is Druina, <laughs> the Cardinal <laughs> here to I say hello again. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, whenever we see Cardinals, we also think of him too. Wow. Were you like used to seeing signs like this kind of along your path? Or do you think when we started working together, I mean, we had these conversations about really going inward. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, like listening to your intuition, 
kind of just that inner journey through this and, and being yeah, really honestly, it's, I don't think that I would have considered myself like a spiritual person or somebody that like looked for these types of things in the past. And even like in the beginning of my journey, I think a lot of it was just so, um, and, you know, I, I would say that I learned this about myself. Like I do weigh the pros and cons and, you know, I'm yeah. sort of like that type of analytical person, but I would say my husband is more so that way where I kind of get a gut feeling about something and not saying that I wouldn't weigh the pros and cons, but that's sort of how I make decisions. And so I think, you know, working with you and, and going mm-hmm. through this, I learned to just sort of lean into that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, less about like doing all of these things. And, you know, cause I did everything. I did acupuncture, I did gluten-free, I did dairy-free. And for this last cycle, I was kind of just like, screw it. Like none of that stuff is working. Yeah. So like, yeah. I'm just gonna like lean into, you know, these signs and lean into being at the right doctor in the right place in the right time. And mm-hmm. things are aligning and, you know, this is my gut. So I'm going to follow my gut and, you mm. know, kind of what happens. Thank you. Thank you for that. I know we talked a lot about trusting your body, mm-hmm. something big you and I chatted about. It was really, really hard. And even when I got pregnant too, um, you know, mm-hmm. we can talk about this a little bit, but I didn't have like a smooth sailing pregnancy. So when I was 12 weeks, um, I had just told my family it was Passover. So everybody knew about the pregnancy and everybody's like so excited. Mm-hmm. Literally the day after that, I started bleeding. Um, and I'd had a miscarriage before. So like, I know what that can mean. And it was a significant amount of blood. I didn't have any cramping this time. So I knew that there was a possibility that it was okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a Saturday morning, of course. So my doctor's office isn't open. I have to call like the emergency line and, um, you know, the doctor there is basically saying like, well, you could wait until Monday or like, if you're really concerned, like you can go to the emergency room. So of course I'm not going to wait till Monday. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The emergency room. This is like probably like five or six in the morning. Um, you know, have to wait there for a little bit, but they were able to find the heartbeat. So it was a subchorionic hematoma, which is um, very common in IVF pregnancies. I just didn't realize that you could get them like that far along at that point when I was almost out of the first trimester. So mm-hmm. I had that. And I, honestly, like the, the very heavy bleeding only lasted that one day, but then I had spotting for, I think a good three, four weeks after that. So because mm-hmm. that didn't fully go away. You know, I was worried about that basically. And then at that point you're seeing your OB only once a month. So like, I'm not getting constant ultrasounds like you are at the fertility clinic. So I had that in the very beginning. Um, I had like, not necessarily a scare, but when I did my glucose tolerance test, um, I failed the one hour so that I thought I might have gestational diabetes, but I got three hours. So that turned out fine. Uh, But then at the very end of my pregnancy in my third trimester, um, I got something which is called cholestasis. And honestly, Mm -hmm. I only knew about what it was because I follow um, another fertility doctor on Instagram who posted about having this. Okay. So when I started to have like a little bit of itching in my hands and my feet, I mentioned it to my OB. And so they did the blood work. And the first time it came up fine, but she was like, I'm just going to repeat it just to see. And then when she repeated the blood work, it came back like high and out of the range. So we knew that I had this cholestasis. Oh my gosh. Oh, and at that point, we also knew that my daughter was breech. So (laughs) then we start talking about the C-section. And so, you know, there were, there were things that came up at the end that were just out of my hand. And even at the very end, I was so nervous about cholestasis because one of the things it says is that it can cause a stillbirth. So I'm like, we need to get this baby out as soon as possible. Like I need to make sure that like everything's fine. So even up until the very end, I was still very nervous and like Mm. really like breathe until they, I was in the, on the operating table and they said like, she's here. And I heard the cry. And Uh, how many weeks were you when she was born? When did you uh, just over 39 weeks, 39. Okay. So we did schedule the C-section. So I guess that was one nice thing about, um, you know, having to go that path was I knew when it was going to happen. I didn't go into labor. So. Mm, they recommended that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Same Which, here. You know, again, it's not the way that I would have chosen to bring her right. into this world, but it was what we had to do to get her there safely. And, you know, mm-hmm. so it is what it is. That's, that's what we did. Oh my gosh. I'm just looking over notes and just hearing you. I'm just like, uh. I think a lot of women can resonate with, um, being the researching type and you shared with me, like you were an overthinker, yeah. you've done so much on your own. And I uh, just being open. I mean, I remember seeing these big shifts in you to kind of like ease into this a bit more, yeah. right. Where you were feeling kind of the confidence in your body, the peace within, and just knowing like you were doing everything you could to optimize. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There was literally like nothing I left on the table at that point. <laughs> I tried everything. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, the supports you, I know you're doing acupuncture. You saw a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. Um, what other things you're part of a support group? Yeah, I was part of fertility rally, mm-hmm. which was huge. Um, cause even, you know, once I got pregnant, they have like a pregnancy group. And so, mm-hmm. um, being able to like, if I was nervous about something, like get reassurance that things were okay. Like when I had the subchorionic hematoma, like I heard from so many other women about it and it made me feel mm-hmm. a little bit better. Um, so getting those sorts of support systems too, because, yeah. you know, I, I, at this point I had shared with like some family and some friends, um, yeah. you know, what we had been going through, but unless you've gone through this, like you just really don't understand. And so yeah. and of course, like my mom or like, you know, a close family member will be there to support me, but they hadn't gone through it. So, um, there's only yeah. so much that you can share that they can understand. And I know some of the other practical things you and I were doing, I I'd done a chakra reading with you. Um, that was really revealing where the crown, the third eye, the root, we talked about all those areas and, yeah. um, did a Reiki session to, together. Yeah, I love that. That was so powerful. Thank you. And you wrote me this, like the most beautiful testimonial with that and just how that really helped kind of prepare you in entering yeah. that one transfer, one of your transfers, one of your many transfers. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, again, being like Mm -hmm. sort of in between the analytical and the spiritual, Mm -hmm. um, I was a little skeptical going into that, like, cause we were doing it over zoom. So I was like, really work like that? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? But I honestly felt like that energy. And when you mentioned, I think at one point you said, Oh, like you're, you're feeling it in your legs. And I was like, Oh my God, that's exactly like where I'm feeling the heat heat in your feet. I remember. Yeah. (laughs) It was, it was crazy. I just, Mm. it was so cool. Oh, thank you. Um, Gosh. Yeah. I mean, just how you stepped into trusting your body, you were open to receiving. There were things we talked about with writing letters to your embryo. I remember, did you write Mila? You didn't know a girl at the time. Right. But I remember you were doing some practices. Um, even we talked about like vision boards and things like that. Yeah. Um, and actually I forgot to mention this, but, um, one other crazy thing was, uh, so with the surrogacy agency, um, so it took a while we knew until we would like hear back from them. And so when I finally got pregnant with this ninth transfer with Mila, they Mm -hmm. called me back when I was like five or six weeks pregnant and they said, we have a match for you. And I was just like, Oh my God, I can't believe the timing of this. Like, it's like, That's incredible. you go for like three years of like having no options, like no pregnancies. And then you have basically have two options. And, you know, it's one of those things. It's so hard to make a decision because all I had known at this point was pregnancy loss. So it's like, do I like cancel the surrogate and like, just trust in myself or like, what do we do? So mm. like, they're pretty flexible. So they basically let us wait until we were comfortable with the pregnancy before we like officially like canceled with them. They let us kind of go on hold. And so mm. we did that, but um, you know, it was one of those things again, like trusting my body being like, I think this is the one, like, I don't think I need the surrogate anymore. Like, I think I'm going to be pregnant and carry this pregnancy. So we waited to tell them until after my 20 week ultrasound. But, um, Mm -hmm. you know, at that point, like we were comfortable and confident and moving forward. That was huge. And just the timing of that is that like so wild. (laughs) There's such power in that, the power of surrender. And I know people hear that a lot. Like when you kind of let go and you just gave yourself space and like, weren't so holding on so tight anymore. It was like, you did trust you were open to how this was all going to unfold and knowing you were going to become a mom yeah, in one way or another. Yeah. And that was it too. You know, I, I wouldn't say that I wanted to have to use a surrogate. Like I was upset about potentially not being able to carry, but I sort of come to peace with it. Cause I just said like, yeah. you know, yeah. the pregnancy is only one small portion of like this baby's life. And, um, you know, I just want to be a mom and I want to have a baby. And so I was going to do whatever it took basically to get to that point. And I just got lucky finally, after all my persistence that oh my we God. figured out a way to make it work for my, for my body, basically. Um, and I, I am thankful that I did get to experience pregnancy because, oh. you know, that's a, that's a beautiful experience to have too. So it um, it's so beautiful. I mean, what do you think were some of those key things that kept you in that mindset to keep you going? Like most people would be like, how do you endure that many rounds? I think, well, part of it is like giving yourself time too. So I never wanted to make a decision like right after that fail or like right Mm -hmm. after that miscarriage, because your mind just isn't in the right place. And so Mm -hmm. I remember like vigorously, like researching like surrogates and like other options, and then kind of like saying, okay, like we'll use that as a backup plan. But like, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I needed to take some time to Um, and again, really feel it out. Like instead of just being the pros and cons, like 
thinking about that intuition and what is my gut telling me? And um, so that was what my gut was basically telling me that like, I hadn't had a second opinion yet. I haven't really, although I've exhausted a lot of options, like there's still a couple things that I haven't done. And I sort of wasn't going to rest until I knew like my mm -hmm. body a hundred percent, like cannot carry a pregnancy, which mm -hmm. I wasn't really a hundred percent there. If you had asked me like after my third miscarriage, I would have said like, yep, that's it. I'm done. But after like waiting another week or two or a month or so, um, and sort of leaning into that feeling, like there was still that little light in me that wanted to keep fighting and keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And your husband through it all. I mean, he was by your side. Every yeah. Second. I mean, he was amazing. Like I said, especially like, even when I transferred to the new fertility clinic, like driving me to New York for these appointments when like, he couldn't even really go in for a lot of this stuff. Like he, he was really there. And, you know, unfortunately during COVID, he couldn't be there for a lot of it, but, um, you know, physically he was giving me the shots and, um, you know, really helping me out mentally and being there to support me. There were many nights I remember just like, being in bed crying and, you know, he was next to me, like holding my hand and crying mm -hmm. with me. And, you know, I, yeah. I definitely couldn't have gotten through it without having oh such gosh. a supportive partner for sure. He's amazing. Yeah. Cause you guys, you, you were a little bit more private, I think through your journey, right? Like not opening up to a ton of friends, you, yeah, had some you know, and that's the thing, because in the beginning, I so didn't expect that this was going to be my journey. I thought it was going to be like even one and done or like not even needing to do IVF. So yeah. Um, I didn't really tell anyone in the beginning because I just figured like, it's just going to be a quick thing. And then I'll tell people afterwards, you know, whatever. And then we started to get so far into it. And I started failing, like feeling like I, even though I know I didn't fail, like it was the transfer failed. Yeah. Um, but then I just didn't want people to be asking me about it all the time because I kept feeling like it's not working and I don't want to keep giving bad news. So even like in my family, my parents knew and um, my husband's parents knew it, but not even like my aunts and uncles and cousins. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't sharing with like extended family. Um, mm -hmm. And so eventually finding fertility rally and like finding you, I, I did build a little bit of a community like on Instagram and social media um, that sort of understood what I was going through. And once I did finally reach out and do that, I felt so much better because I'd basically been keeping it in and not talking to anybody about it for so long. Yeah. Um, and then slowly I would say like, um, I started to tell like a couple friends here and there. And then like, honestly, I haven't posted a ton publicly, like on social media, just cause I feel like there's people that follow me on there that don't necessarily need to know like all the right. details. But, right. Um, you know, at this point, if somebody asked me like, sure, I'd be an open book about it because, you know, you sort of realize that you feel alone because you don't hear about a lot of people going through these things and people aren't always posting like all the negative stuff online. So um, if I could help somebody else, um, sure, I'll, I'll gladly, mm -hmm. you know, share my story and share whatever expertise I've gained at this point um, after years of doing this. Seriously. I mean, I'm, that's why one of the big reasons I'm so grateful to, that you said yes, because you are more private about your journey and that yeah. I, I just know how much this is going to impact so many to help them keep moving forward and, I mean, what a journey you've had. Yeah. I mean, I hope I can help other people. And, you know, since I have opened up a little bit, you know, I've spoken on the phone to um, some like friends of friends who've been going through this and, mm -hmm. you know, it always feels so nice to be able to kind of support someone else. And like I said, it's crazy the amount of knowledge and things that I've learned. I never knew I'd be like so knowledgeable about female reproduction as I am now. Um, and it's funny. I like joke to my husband that like, I could come back and be like a fertility nurse and <laughs> my next life, I feel like, but, um, yeah, obviously I, I'd love to help other women. And I, I know how hard it is going through it. And, um, mm -hmm. it's hard to see that, that light at the end, but you know, if, if you feel it's still there, there's, there's going to be a way to get there one way or the other. Would you advise to women who are on this path, like not to research everything, not Google everything? Like, are there any things that you would say, like, this yeah, is not I mean, going to help you get closer to that goal? I think it depends on what it is. Like certainly uh -huh. during my pregnancy, for sure. It was like every little twinge and pain I was so nervous about to the mm -hmm. point that it was like, I kind of just had to trust my doctor at that point. When she told me, like, I think it was around 16 weeks, she said, like, you can stop being nervous now. Like this is going to oh. happen. Like all of your tests have come back normal. Like your ultrasounds yeah. are great. Everything's perfect. And you know, you being in this community, you hear the stories of the worst mm -hmm. that happened. So I would go through those scenarios in my head, but it would just give me such bad anxiety. And I was like, I want to enjoy this pregnancy more. Like, I don't want to be so yeah. anxious all the time. So I won't lie and say I wasn't anxious after that. Of course I had moments of it, but I definitely tried to stay off 
Google if I could, because <laughs> you can find any kind of story if you start Googling it. So. For sure. And advocating for yourself. I know you were always yes, good about asking for one. additional scans and like yeah. that helped ease your anxiety, um, yeah. leaning into trust. Um, trust yeah, I mean, I think that ad advocating for yourself is such a big one. Honestly, mm -hmm. before this happened to me, I never would have thought about like, bringing research to a doctor. Like you think they're a doctor, they're an expert. Like you just do what they say. And like, that's it. I I've never gotten a second opinion from a doctor before, you know, just certain mm -hmm. things like that. Um, certainly I'll take that forward, like in my life. And now with Mila too, I'm sure there'll be things that I'll have to advocate for her for, but, um, it's just such a, a good skill to develop. And unfortunately, like, I wish I didn't have to go through this journey, but it's one of the, the positives of, of learning how to do that. And at this moment, I know she's just almost four months old. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing this call in between feedings and nap time and Courtney. Yeah, time. she's probably going to be waking up in a couple oh, minutes here, but we'll right wrap now she's up in just sleeping. a bit. Oh my gosh. How is it being a mom? Like, just tell me a little bit about like, what has this been? What is this experience? I mean, I think like there's obviously highs and lows of motherhood um, and things that are really hard and just things that are so amazing. I think mm -hmm. like just watching her grow and seeing her hit different milestones. And it's funny, you never think you're going to be like so excited about like the first time she rolls over, or, like, you know, the first time she smiles, like there's little things, but um, mm -hmm. seeing her be like more interactive now and like recognizing myself and my husband and laughing, like it's just yeah. so cute when she does that. And um, you know, there's, there's times that it's hard, like in the beginning, especially when they're crying, you don't know, are they hungry? Are they tired? Like what do they need? Yeah. And then you feel like a terrible mother because you can't yeah. figure it out, but literally everybody's going through this and, um, you know, yeah. you, you just kind of learn it with time. Like I, I read some books and there's tips you can follow, but really it's just learning your own baby and what they want. Yeah. And, um, just trusting that, you know, they know you, you're the mother and, um, you're not, you're never going to be perfect, but you know exactly what they need. And, and they're just happy to have you there. Oh my gosh. She's going to have quite, you're going to share this story with her one day and be like, I mean, all that you went through to bring her. Yeah. To I always joke, like when she's a teenager and she's like mad at me, I'm going to be like, I went through so much. To get you. Oh. Like, you can't be mad at me. <laughs> Didn't you have a gold necklace that you wore? Like that was something that too, that brought you a lot of comfort. Yeah, I had like a couple things. So one was um, my mom actually had a miscarriage before she had my brother Drew. And so my grandma had given her um, these two mm. gold heart necklaces. And so mm. my mom kept one and gave me one after my first miscarriage. And she said, like, I know you're going to have that rainbow baby. And when you have that baby, you'll get the second one. And so after oh. I had Mila, she gave me the second necklace. So now oh. I um, and you can pass it on to her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I just thank you so much for sharing so openly. Yeah, of course. This was great. Oh my God. I love you. And just, oh, wow. Any other final thoughts for any woman? Like, I mean, you were in the trenches for years and years, nine rounds, like any little words of comfort you can share to some woman listening right now. Yeah. I think, you know, like I said, just find that support system, whatever that means for you. You don't have to be somebody that's like posting everything publicly on social media. I know I wasn't, but I was certainly like messaging people and, um, going to support groups and like sharing my story and hearing from other women. And I think that's so important, like reaching out to find those, those avenues. And, you know, like we talked about, just listen to your gut, listen to your intuition. If something feels off, like it probably is. Um, if your doctor is, rubbing you the wrong way, like get that second opinion. I wish I had done it sooner, but, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. I've, I've learned that now and I've, I've learned how to advocate for myself. So I wish anybody good luck on this journey and, you know, keep all those things in mind. And like I said, there's, there's a way, there's a way to the end goal. Um, it might not be what, what you thought it's going to look like, but there's a way to get there. And it is amazing <laughs> once you do. Thank you so much, Brooke. Yeah. Thanks. Lisa. Bye. Bye.